uh, good night. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the last seminar in this series, and we are very happy uh, to have uh, Avi Loeb, uh, who will be telling us about the black holes, uh, the topics of uh, this year's uh, Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, Avi is has done a lot of uh, original work in black holes. He's also an excellent communicator of science to the general public. So uh, this talk will be uh, one hour, which is a uh, 45 minutes talk plus 15 minutes of uh, questions. Avi. Thank you very much, uh, Shingang. Let me share my screen. I hope you can, can you see it? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So let me just open the presentation. Okay, so this is particularly fitting uh, in the context of a Copernicus uh, webinar, uh, because um, as you well know, uh, Copernicus uh, made a revolution in our understanding of our place in the universe, uh, uh, which opened up uh, the view of, of modern cosmology. That was the beginning. Uh, and uh, another important lesson is that he changed the conception that existed prior to his time about the Earth being at the center, um, uh, illustrating that data is extremely important in developing ideas. Uh, this lesson is forgotten these days. Uh, there are lots of people uh, a large community of people that believes that they can sit in their room and come up with a description of nature without even needing experiment. Unfortunately, uh, the group of those people uh, has been trying to do so, unify quantum mechanics and gravity for five decades without making a specific testable prediction that we can uh, use. And uh, what I would like to encourage in this talk is the dialogue that we have between experiments, observations, and theory, which is a way for us to learn about nature. So it's a learning experience. That's what physics is all about. And that's what Copernicus really taught us. Uh, and what I'll try to describe is a subject that was very much uh, mathematical uh, for many decades. And in fact, Einstein thought that black holes do not even exist. He wrote a paper in 1939, arguing that in Annals of Mathematics. And then uh, in 2015, we received the direct uh, signal from the collision of two black holes at the edge of the universe that uh, gave the uh, uh, Nobel Prize in 2017 to the LIGO collaboration. You can see it here on the, on the left. Uh, um, and then uh, this year, the Nobel Prize was awarded specifically for the study of black holes, experimental study, and also a mathematical study. Uh, and I'll talk more about it uh, a bit later. Um, so two Nobel Prizes in three years that touch on black holes, that's quite impressive. This subject came from obscurity, from a mathematical construct to be a facet of um, modern physics uh, with experimental verification. So that's, that's remarkable and Copernicus would have been delighted to see that. Um, and another uh, venue that uh, gives us information about black holes is imaging, direct imaging. We, we now have uh, an image of M87 that was obtained in the Black Hole Initiative that I'm serving the director of at uh, Harvard University. You can see it at the bottom. And in fact, uh, it's a light ring uh, that comes from about 5 GM over C squared, not exactly the event horizon. So it shouldn't be called the event horizon telescope really. Uh, although it sounds academic, uh, for an, an astronaut that gets close to a black hole, the factor of 2.5 relative to the Schwarzschild radius is existential. If, if that astronaut gets into the horizon, there is no way out, and life is very short indeed inside. Uh, but uh, two and a half times the Schwarzschild radius, life is possible. Um, and then on the right, you see more than 50 uh, systems, black hole mergers that were detected by the LIGO uh, Virgo collaboration. Uh, and there was even a discussion in the New York Times just a couple of months ago whether there might be a black hole in our backyard in the solar system. And I'll, I'll talk more about it. Oops. So let me start with a brief uh, mention of the black hole initiative that we have at Harvard. Uh, this center brings together mathematicians, astronomers, philosophers, uh, and um, 
uh, uh, physicists. Uh, so these are four communities of scholars that speak, uh, by now they speak a similar language. At the beginning, I was worried of the uh, Tower of Babel situation where people would speak different languages, not speak with each other, and it would be a disaster. But actually we learn the vocabulary of each other and we speak a, a common language by now. So it's a very uh, fascinating experience to be there. Uh, and uh, the inauguration, uh, hosted the Stephen Hawking that you can see here on the top uh, left. Uh, the, the building is 20 Garden Street and you're all invited to visit us. So uh, this is the image uh, that appeared uh, in uh, April 2019. Uh, it was uh, derived at the uh, conference room of the Black Hole Initiative. Uh, and it represents an effort that took uh, years uh, by the Event Horizon Telescope team. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, it should not really be called an Event Horizon Telescope because uh, the truth is uh, in advertising that it's imaging uh, two and a half to five times the radius of uh, the horizon. So, so we are really looking at a, a ring of light uh, due to the effects of gravitational lensing that is far out from where the horizon is. But we do see an, a, a shadow in the middle because light rays that go close enough to the horizon get uh, swallowed. So we don't see them from behind. And what we are seeing is basically uh, the illumination uh, of the space time around the black hole from the accretion flow around it. The actual photon ring is, is narrower than we see in the image can see it on the left from a simulation. And the story really starts uh, a century ago, a little more than that, 105 years ago, when uh, Albert Einstein in November 1915 formulated his theory of gravity, uh, but couldn't find a solution, analytic solution. And then uh, Carl Schwarzschild, who was around 40 years old at the time, he was the director of the Potsdam Observatory, and uh, he was a German patriot. Both of them were Jewish. The difference was that Einstein was a pacifist and Schwarzschild was a patriot. So Schwarzschild went to the German front. It was the first world war and, and decided to fight for the Germans. And within about half a year, he, he died at the front from some rare uh, lung disease. But in the meantime, between Einstein's uh, publication and his death, uh, Karl was able to derive the solution, the Schwarzschild solution that uh, describes a black hole. And uh, the bottom line from this story is that if you want to work out uh, the full details of a theory, you better be a pacifist. So Schwarz's solution uh, includes, as you well know, a horizon It's for non-spinning black hole and Kerr extended it later, uh, decades later. Uh, and you can see here the orbits of photons that uh, emanate from uh, a point in space. So if you have a flashlight and you shine it in different directions, the photons will uh, execute different orbits. And of course, if you shine it close enough to the horizon, the photons will get swallowed by the horizon and we will never see them again. And there is this photon orbit that you can see. Now, on the scale of the horizon, we know, I mean, of the information paradox, which uh, stems from uh, a quantum mechanical effect. Obviously, particles that have a de Broglie wavelength comparable to the size of the horizon are not captured within this prison. So this is the ultimate prison that captures any prisoner, except if the prisoner has a foot outside the prison, then you can't capture that prison. And that's what happens for particles that have a wavelength longer than the horizon. And that's what Hawking are recognized that uh, there is leakage of thermal radiation from the vacuum uh, with wavelengths comparable or longer than the horizon. And that actually causes black holes to evaporate and raises the information paradox. So if information falls into the black hole and the radiation is purely thermal as Hawking derived, where does the information go? According to quantum mechanics, unitarity must be preserved. Um, and this Paradox. I mean, although people are making progress, uh, the progress is still 
a work in progress. We don't have a solution to this paradox as of yet. Uh, and then on the Planck scale, uh, at the center of the Schwarzschild solution, there is a singularity. And, you know, um, when uh, the basement in my home uh, was flooded one time, uh, uh, I came to realize that indeed uh, the water that flows through my home is going somewhere. It's not, you know, I always thought it goes down the drain and I forgot about it, but th it actually goes through the sewer to some reservoir. And then I realized maybe in a black hole, there is something similar, you know, all the matter that falls into a black hole must collect somewhere. So where does it collect? It could collect in a remnant near the center, near the singularity, and that would be Planck density. That's a possibility. We don't have a, a, a reliable quantum theory of gravity, but you can imagine something like a giant star at the Planck density sitting at the center and collecting all the matter that comes in. That's one possibility. Or it could go to another universe, something else. Uh, until we develop a theory of quantum gravity, we will never know. Uh, fortunately, there is the horizon that protects us from the uncertainty. But there is this fundamental question. What happens both at the horizon with Hawking radiation and at the singularity? Now, for an astrophysicist, you don't really need to worry about these subtleties. Uh, you can have fun around a black hole. Uh, for example, a black hole is the ultimate source of clean energy. If you dump your trash on an accretion disk, you can get up to 42% of the rest mass of this trash in radiation. And that's a very efficient engine, more than the nuclear reactors that we have, right? Much more effi efficient. I mean, the only thing that can compete with it is matter-antimatter engine, but such engines blow up. Uh, nobody was able to construct a matter-antimatter engine. So um, you can also imagine tapping the spin energy of a black hole and just like a flywheel uh, using it for your activities, uh, surfing uh, with light sails on relativistic jets, uh, having beauty salons uh, to prolong youth near a black hole because clocks are ticking more slowly close to a black hole. You can use a spectacle of the entire universe reflected near a black hole because of gravitational lensing all the images of all the stars, galaxies, and so forth can be viewed near the horizon of a black hole. You can establish an amusement park where you, uh, you sit at the photon sphere and then you can look at your back by staring forward because the photons go a full circle around the black hole. Um, you can, uh, uh, when, when there are two black holes coming together, you can use them as a slingshot to get ejected at a speed close to the speed of light. Uh, you can send criminals to a black hole, of course, as the ultimate prison. Uh, you can use gravitational waves uh, to send signals from a black hole. And you can test fundamental physics very close to a black hole. Speaking about that, um, here is um, uh, a, a short video In from a conference the conference we had the hypothetical questions the about what the black hole looks like could be solved by a field trip uh, in one of the future uh, BHI conferences. And that's why it's so crucial. Uh, Who are you volunteering to go? <laughs> you need, uh, it's, well, I, I actually recommend many of my uh, friends that work on string theory to, uh, uh, to test Test the theory experimentally. I mean, after all, we don't have a lot of experimental tests, and one obvious one is I just like you have ulterior motives. <laughs> so but this was an exchange with Nima Arkani Hamed, as you noticed. Black hole. Um, and um, I will not elaborate on that unless someone has a question at the end, whether I really meant sending screening theories for a different reason into a black hole. Anyway, um, uh, an interesting question is, what, where is the nearest black hole? You might think, well, maybe there is a black hole in the outskirts of the solar system. For example, if the dark matter is made of black holes uh, and, and their mass is comparable to the Earth or just a bit uh, lower than that, there should be one captured by the solar system. And there is actually an object called Planet Nine. Uh, it's assumed to be a planet, of course, it's in the outskirts of the solar system, inferred indirectly. So people 
used the, the best telescopes to search for it and couldn't find it. So we said, okay, what if, if it's a black hole that makes the dark matter? What, what, uh, is there a way to figure it out? Uh, speaking about the possibility of, of a field trip to that, if, if it turns out to be a black hole, that would be amazing. Instead of just sending uh, spacecrafts to objects that are relatively boring, like uh, Pluto or Neptune and so forth, uh, you, you imagine having a black hole in the Milky Way, in the, in the solar system. Anyway, uh, how can we find out whether there is a black hole and whether Planet Nine, as an example, is a black hole? There, it turns out that there is a way. Um, the outskirts of the solar system out to a distance of about 100,000 times the Earth-Sun separation uh, are filled with icy rocks. These are the Oort cloud the objects. And uh, these are responsible for the long period comets that we see when, when they come close to the sun, the, the ice, the water ice on their surface evaporates and you see it as a cometary tail. And uh, Fred Whipple, who was at Harvard, came up with the idea that they might be uh, rocky ice or icy rocks uh, after walking through Harvard Square on a, on a snowstorm. Um, so uh, uh, imagine uh, this black hole sitting in this uh, sea of icy rocks, every now and then one of them would come close enough to be tidally disrupted and the matter would accrete onto the black hole and you would get a flash. So we calculated with my student, Amir Siraj, the frequency of such uh, flashes. And we found that LSST, the survey that uh, is scheduled with the Vera Rubin Observatory in three years from now, uh, we'll find at least uh, a few such flashes every year, um, depending on the distance of the bl black hole, but taking the parameters that were inferred for planet nine, this would be a good way of finding if a black hole is planet nine. And the characteristic, you can see here at, at the bottom left, the characteristic emission frequency would be around the optical band, optical infrared band, 10 to the 15 Hertz, uh, just at the distance where planet nine is. We use the radiatively inefficient accretion model uh, to describe the accretion onto such a black hole. So there is a way of testing um, if planet nine is a black hole. Uh, but um, in fact, in a paper to be published, it's uh, still being reviewed and I'm giving you a scoop here. So keep it to yourself. Uh, it's under press embargo. Uh, we uh, found evidence for the nearest black hole at a distance of about a hundred parsecs. So that's uh, about 300 light years away. Uh, and this black hole has a thousand solar masses. It's an intermediate mass black hole. Now, what is the evidence that we have for this black hole? We have uh, four different pieces of evidence. One, as you see on the top left, there is a distribution uh, of stars uh, around it. Actually, um, uh, we are showing the concentration of stars uh, at, at, that is way over dense uh, relative to the background in that region. Um, and we derived it from Gaia uh, DR2 data release. Um, these stars are moving uh, faster uh, close to some center of mass uh, than you expect based on the mass in those stars. Uh, moreover, there is X -ray, an X-ray source just in the middle of this star cluster. Uh, and the X-ray source uh, you can see on the, on the right here. Um, and then uh, amazingly enough, there happened to be a star moving behind the center of this cluster and you get gravitational lensing. You can see that uh, on the bottom left. Uh, oops, sorry about that. On the bottom left, you can see the data points um, uh, of uh, at different times uh, showing uh, the best fit in blue for uh, the gravitational lensing light curve. And uh, according to the proper motion that we have, we can actually infer the, the appropriate uh, motion uh, of the lens relative to the source uh, based on the Gaia data. Um, and then, uh, so, so altogether, we have 
concentration of stars, uh, orbits of uh, in faster speeds of stars closer to the center of mass. Uh, and then uh, X-rays and gravitational lensing as the evidence, and they are all consistent uh, with the existence of a thousand solar mass black hole at around 100 parsecs. And of course, future data can uh, validate this. Now, we know that the, at the center of the Milky Way, there is an even bigger black hole, a four million solar masses in total. It's called Sagittarius A star. There is a faint radio source at the appropriate location. Uh, this black hole is starved, uh, not being fed much. It could have been fed uh, about 100 million times more mass. Uh, and then it would shine like a bright um, active galactic nucleus. But, but it's, it, that, there is not much gas there. And that's to our advantage, because then we can, in principle, image it. Otherwise, the gas would make the, the environment opaque. But uh, the reason we know about this black hole is uh, the reason that both Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Ghez got the Nobel Prize uh, this year. Uh, they monitor the orbits of stars, as you can see on the bottom left. Um, the right panel shows the UCLA, uh, Andrea Ghez uh, team uh, data. And uh, uh, the, the panel on the left is from uh, Reinhard Genzel's uh, Garching's uh, group. Um, data. So, um, and, and the amazing thing is, even though the, the two groups were uh, very competitive and uh, they had a fierce uh, rivalry, uh, their data agreed perfectly. So it's, uh, it perhaps it demonstrates that competition is good for science. Um, and then um, one thing we learned about the stars closest to the black hole, except for the fact that they execute Keplerian orbits and indicate 4 million solar masses where you see very little light there. Uh, the, the other thing is that the, the stars are residing in two planes, two preferred planes, presumably because these are the planes of the disks, the gas disks that made the, the stars near in the vicinity within about a thousand Schwarzschild radii uh, to 10,000 Schwarzschild radii of the black hole. And these stars are moving at uh, thousands of kilometers per second at pericenter. So there are two preferred planes, but what we realized with uh, Giacomo Fragione, who is a postdoc at Chicago, uh, is that um, in fact, if the black hole had a, a large spin, these stars would not stay in a single plane. Uh, if the spin is misaligned with the orbital plane, uh, angular momentum, then you would get what is called the uh, steering precession. Uh, there is some uh, noise coming from someone's. Uh, anyway, um, and uh, as a result, the orbital planes will not be preserved and you'll get blurring of the two planes, two preferred planes. And so the question is what's the upper limit on the spin that you can set? And uh, based on the age estimates for the stars, which uh, you can see in green in the plots uh, on the right-hand side, uh, we calculated the frame dragging time scale, the, the time scale it takes to blur the planes because stars are at different distances from the black hole in those planes. Uh, we calculated the, uh, the time scale uh, as a function of uh, the black hole spin, the dimensional spin chi. And we concluded, uh, you know, like if you look at the bottom uh, left panel, uh, that's for a spin of 0.1. There are some stars that have a time scale less than the age uh, estimated for them. Uh, and so um, we concluded that the spin of the black hole uh, in Sagittarius A star has to be less than 10% of its maximal value. Now, this is news, even though the two groups got the Nobel Prize this year. Nobody inferred until now a, a clear bound on the spin. Uh, I mean, there were hints from some Im early images of uh, the black hole shadow, but they were not good quality. And here we derive an upper limit just based on the two planes of the stars. So I think it's pretty robust. Uh, just surprising to me that the groups that had all the data did not do it before us uh, anyway. Uh, another uh, idea that um, uh, came to mind is that, um, you know, these stars, when 
they are moving around the black hole, they can occult it. They behave just like planets moving around a star, right? So one way to detect planets around stars is by the deficit in the brightness of the star that when they pass in front of the star. Uh, these are called transits and that's how many planets are discovered, were discovered by the Kepler satellite, for example. And so you can ask the same question, uh, could we get occultation of the photon ring of Sagittarius A star uh, when a star passes in front of it? And perhaps we can detect it with uh, the Event Horizon Telescope. And what we showed in a paper with Pierre Christian is, yes, indeed, this is possible, but not with the current Event Horizon Telescope. Um, you need, the, for example, uh, one of the stations to be in space so that you get a high enough resolution of, uh, of this thin ring and uh, so that the star will really occult it in your image. And for more details, you can go to the ar archive and see the paper. Um, another paper, and this one is in preparation with my student Betty Ho, Betty Hu, sorry, from the physics department. Um, we considered the possibility that stars will collide in the vicinity of a black hole. So you're all familiar with the possibility that a star will be ripped apart by a black hole, but if the black hole is more massive than 100 million solar masses, the Schwarzschild radius is bigger than the tidal disruption distance. And so the stars are swallowed whole when they come close to the black hole. They are not being uh, tidally disrupted at all, above a, a mass of 10 to the eight solar masses. Um, but uh, in those cases, for those black holes, the environment could lead, for example, in M87, the black hole is 6 billion solar masses. Many quasars have those masses. In those environments, stars could collide with each other. They will not be ripped apart, even if they approach very close to the horizon. So they can collide with each other at close to the speed of light. That's quite remarkable. Uh, because the amount of kinetic energy that you get deposited in the material is unprecedented. Nuclear reactions cannot do that. And so you can get explosions that are much more powerful than supernovae. And that's what we calculated. We calculated the event rate as a function of energy. You can get, get much more than 10 to the 51 ergs. Um, so um, you can get 10 to the 54 ergs or, or even more depending on the mass of, of the stars. And uh, of course, most of the collisions would be grazing, but there would be some that would be head on. And with LSST, we can search for these collisions. Again, uh, I was struck that nobody analyzed this uh, in the literature, except uh, for some old paper that I wrote with previous student. Some, for some reason, people just don't do the obvious things. Um, so sorry about that. Um, another interesting question is, uh, when we consider supermassive black holes, um, can we actually resolve the effect, the influence they have on the dynamics of the galaxy? Um, and how far can we do that? Uh, so for nearby black holes like Sagittarius A star, M87, of course we can. I mean, that's one way by which the existence of these black holes was uh, inferred uh, to start with, um, but we can do it only in the nearby universe when we look at scales of order tens of parsecs um, or parsec in the center of the Milky Way. But uh, it turns out that uh, the situation is actually better if you go to high redshifts. Um, uh, at a redshift of six, for example, um, you can see the radius of influence at the uh, top left uh, panel the radius of influence in kiloparsecs as a function of redshift at high redshift. And the different lines correspond to different stellar masses uh, for those galaxies. This is work uh, we did with uh, Hamsa Padmanabhan. Uh, all of the work that I'm describing was done over the past um, uh, year or so. Um, so uh, what one can see is that um, a black hole in a galaxy with uh, even 10% of the stellar mass of the Milky Way back at redshift six 
the black hole would, assuming the M sigma relation, the, the characteristic relation between mass and velocity dispersion of black holes in galaxies, um, back at redshift six, the black hole would influence the dynamics of the galaxy out to roughly a, a half a kiloparsec. So that's, that's very far out. And in fact, the angular scale that, that one can uh, uh, resolve with the James Webb Sp Space Telescope is way below that. Uh, we're talking about angular scales of about a fifth of an arc second. Uh, so that's definitely resolvable. And that offers a new opportunity for detecting supermassive black holes at very early cosmic times. They don't need to be active. Right now we're detecting them as quasars. Turns out that if you just follow uh, the evolution of galaxies over redshift and use the M sigma relation for black holes, turns out that black holes influence regions that we can resolve with the James Webb Space Telescope at redshift six or above. So that's, that's quite interesting actually. Um, another interesting question that was always puzzling to me is whether, you know, we, we know LIGO detected one, at least one source that was a, a neutron star black hole merger and had an electromagnetic counterpart to the gravitational wave signal. And as a result, we could determine the redshift because we saw the electromagnetic counterpart, we found the galaxy, we found the redshift, we knew the cosmological distance. Um, and in fact, you could, in principle, constrain the Hubble constant this way, because you have both the redshift and the distance that you constrain from gravitational waves. Um, but an interesting question is, suppose you have just two black holes merging, the, there is no matter, it's just structures of space-time colliding and generating waves in space-time, okay? So you have no electromagnetic counterpart, can you tell the redshift? And if you think about it, uh, and I thought about this uh, for a while, the answer is no, because the redshift is embedded in the chirp mass in a way that you can't separate it from the masses of the object. So if you knew the masses of the objects, uh, then you could infer the redshift. That's what happens, for example, for electromagnetic radiation in the context of atoms. How can we figure out the redshift? Because we know the properties of an atom. We know the electron, we know the nucleus. We can calculate or we can measure in the laboratory the rest frame wavelength. And then we, in, we measure, we observe the wavelength and we see the, the ratio of the two, we infer the redshift. This doesn't exist in gravitational wave sources. We don't have atoms that are of some known mass. And so as a result, we cannot use the same method to infer the redshift just as we do in electromagnetic radiation. But it turns out it's possible. There is a way to do that. And that's what we did with Dan Dorazio uh, in a paper a few months ago. And so the idea is to take advantage of the curvature of the wave front. So think of, an, of a gravitational wave just like an electromagnetic wave. It has a wave front of a constant phase that propagates at the speed of light. And then imagine we have the Earth, uh, just look at the, uh, uh, at the panel on the right, the Earth and a pulsar. And suppose we know the distance to the pulsar perfectly. Then you realize that the wave front reaches Earth before it reaches the pulsar. There is a, a, a difference because of the curvature of the wave front. And the curvature of the wave front carries information about the distance. The bigger the distance, the less curvature you have, the closer you are to a plane wave. So if you can measure the arrival time differ difference between the pulsar and the Earth, and you know exactly the Earth pulsar separation, then you can figure out the distance to the gravitational wave source without an electromagnetic signal coming from that source. This is a parallax measurement using gravitational waves. And it allows you to determine redshifts in principle, even without an electromagnetic counterpart. The problem is to make it practical. And um, you know, it, it will require uh, substantial improvements in, in current uh, instrumentation, current distances to pulsars. But you know, of the, the pulsar timing array, I mean, it's basically an, ex an extension of the pulsar timing array. 
but at least there is conceptually a way to infer redshifts from pure gravitational wave information. That's what we did in this paper. And you know, a, month a few months later, there was a follow-up paper on, on the same uh, theme. So, and of course, they, they cited our paper. Um, so that's an interesting uh, path uh, for the future of gravitational wave astrophysics. Oops. Um, now, with respect to those very massive black holes, supermassive black holes, the question is how do they grow over cosmic time? This is a paper we wrote with Fabio Pacucci. Uh, and um, well, the plots that you see, the panels are more for astrophysicists in the sense that they list uh, a number of uh, future instruments that will constrain the evolution of black holes over cosmic time. You can see Lynx, Axis, Athena, Lisa. I don't have time to get to the details of each of those. But so let me just show you the cartoon maybe um, of the conclusion uh, based on the analysis that we have done of theoretical models for the growth of black holes. It turns out that if you follow the uh, mergers of galaxies over cosmic history and the growth of black holes within galaxies, it turns out that in the nearby universe, uh, the big holes are growing by mergers. Um, and the small black holes have some accretion onto them. But if you go to the early universe, the high redshift universe, uh, it's the other way around, that the big black holes are growing mostly by accretion of gas, whereas the smaller black holes grow by mergers. And, and um, that is interesting. And that explains this perspective, explains why we see these bright quasars at early cosmic times. And this model that we developed can be tested with those uh, future instruments that I mentioned to you. Of course, the one uncertainty we still have is what are the seeds that were planted early on? Were the seeds, uh, the black hole seeds, were they stellar mass or were they supermassive stellar mass? You know, stars that are a million times the mass of the sun that collapse to make a seed. That's also possible. Now, uh, speaking about mergers, one uh, novel way to find binary black holes, uh, two, two black holes coming together, is by imaging them. So I mentioned the Event Horizon Telescope as a way to get an image of the silhouette of a black hole. But in fact, in this paper with Dan Dorazio, we actually argued that you could search for binary black holes with the Event Horizon Telescope. So if you monitor an extragalactic source at millimeter wavelength, and you see the active galactic nucleus, the quasar, executing a circle on the sky over some orbital time, you know that it has a companion. And even better, if you have two sources moving around the common center of mass, that would be fantastic. So we calculated the likelihood of the Event Horizon Telescope, or Gaia, actually, uh, depending on the wavelength. The Event Horizon Telescope at millimeter wavelength, Gaia uh, at the uh, optical. Uh, either of these, what is the chance uh, of finding binaries this way, of extragalactic supermassive black holes? And we found a few. Uh, over their, the mission time scales, they could find a few, each of them. So it's not easy. But what is easy to, is to see quasars at high redshifts. And the question is, do we have a complete census? As you know, you know many of us are skeptical now about the uh, political polls, because in the last two elections, they were way off uh, from reality. And of course, it's because a lot of people do not uh, go to the polls and the statisticians have to work with limited data. And uh, so you can always find excuses. But an interesting question to ask is forgetting about politics. If you go to the early universe, do we see all the supermassive black holes? Do all of them vote? I mean, do all of them participate in our, in our census? Let's put it this way. Um, and it may not be the case. And the reason is simple gravitational lensing. 
So if you have a foreground galaxy in front of a, a background quasar, suppose the quasar is shining, it's not obscured. In principle, we can see it. And, but if there is a galaxy sitting in front of it, you will mix the light of the galaxy or the spectrum of the galaxy with that of the quasar. So you'll get a combined spectrum. And that could fool you because the galaxy may be closer to us than the quasar. And the sum of the two spectra will indicate an object that is not really a quasar because it has some narrow lines and stuff like that. And the quasar is high redshift. So you might not recognize its emission lines at first. Uh, the combined spectrum would be confusing. Now, why would we get a situation where you have a galaxy sitting in front of a quasar? Most of lines of sight do not pass through galaxies. Well, there is a special selection effect and that, that is due to gravitational lensing. Uh, the quasar luminosity function is very steep at the bright end. There are very few bright quasars co compared to faint quasars. Because it's so steep, if you take a faint quasar and magnify it by gravitational lens, then it could, even if the probability for doing that is small, you could completely change the abundance of uh, quasars that you see at high brightness. So it's possible that most of the quasars that we see at high brightness are being gravitationally magnified, but then those that are being gravitational magnified are also having a galaxy in front of them and we miss them. And so it's possible that most lensed quasars at redshifts above six are missed because of the effect that I was describing. And for the quantitative details, I encourage you to check uh, the archive, this paper. Now, an interesting question, given the image of M87, uh, were we lucky? Um, you know, uh, how many such big black holes should we see on the sky? What are the biggest black holes that we can image on the sky? So what we did in this work um, that is work in progress, uh, we haven't yet uh, submitted it, um, it's, um, is uh, to take a census of the most massive black holes that we find from quasars and then say, okay, Today, these black holes are dormant. We don't see them as quasars. There are very few quasars today. Most of the black holes are starved, just like the Milky Way one. Um, so you don't see those as quasars. They're dormant, they're dark. But in principle, if there is a little bit of gas falling onto them, you could see their shadow. And uh, the question is, how many of those should exist? And where, where is the nearest one as a function of mass and how big is it on the sky? So what we did is take the uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey data on the brightest quasars and just translate it into an abundance of massive black holes in the present day universe. Black holes do not evaporate. You know, these big black holes do not evaporate uh, and uh, they should be around. So there is no way out. Uh, so what you see on the left panel is uh, the uh, distribution, the number of black holes on the sky uh, above some uh, minimum angle uh, where, the, the, where the ring, the photon ring is bigger than some angle. And you can see that with the error bars, which are Poisson error bars, we do get uh, roughly one M87 like black hole uh, as big as M87 is on the sky. Of course, if we were lucky and we were much closer to the center of the Virgo cluster, we would see M87 much bigger. But we are almost at a typical place. We are at the outskirts of the Virgo cluster. The over density locally is about two or three. Uh, M87 is sitting at the center of the Virgo cluster. You can see it at the bottom here. It has a very powerful jet that goes out to you know, hundreds of thousands of light years, uh, very far out, relativistically collimated. Uh, and um, uh, we are almost at a typical place in the universe. You can see it from the uh, left uh, panel uh, that we would expect something like M87, uh, one of that of such. But there would be, there should be many more that are smaller in in size. Um, okay. 
Now, as I mentioned briefly, if you consider the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, Sagittarius A star, or any black hole smaller than 10 to the eight solar masses, uh, the tidal disruption of a sun-like star occurs outside the horizon of such black holes. Um, in other, another way to say it is the tidal force exerted on the star, the difference in force between the front of the star and the back of the star is bigger than the, than the star's self-gravity, than the force that binds the star. Uh, at a distance that is larger than the horizon, if that distance was smaller than the horizon, which is the case above 10 to the 8 solar masses, you wouldn't see anything because it will all happen inside the black hole. So of course, near the singularity, everything is torn apart, any object. But what we want is to see a flare from the disruption of a star. And this is called spaghettization of a star. If it passes within the tidal disruption distance, you can see the formula at the bottom. Uh, it's proportional to the mass of the black hole over the mass of the star to the third power because it's a tidal force times the radius of the star. Now, the interesting point that we made in this very recent paper with Hamsa Padmanabhan is that, in fact, uh, tidal disruptions will change the look of the quasar. You will suddenly get a lot of gas around the black hole. And uh, in fact, there is a population of such quasars that was discussed in the literature called uh, changing look quasar. So people found some strange quasars that are changing their look on a time scale that we can monitor. Most of the time you think quasars evolve on time scales of tens of millions of years, much longer than our lifetime, much longer than the PhD thesis of a typical student. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say of all students, because I remember that we used to have a student that uh, was in our department for longer than most of the faculty. Uh, we don't have it uh, such situations anymore, but we used to have one. Um, um, anyway, um, so an interesting point is that a tidal disruption, the tidal disruption rate, the rate that you expect for such events indeed could explain a substantial fraction of those changing look quasars. And in fact, also the Compton thick quasars. These are quasars that are being obscured by a blanket of gas that is very optically thick. And you know, people said, oh, maybe there is a torus of gas surrounding it. We've never seen that torus, but it could exist. And it's quite possible because sometimes when we look from above the torus, we see the quasar, but it could also be the tidal stream of a, a, a spaghettified star. Um, okay. Uh, finally, let me discuss stellar mass black holes. Uh, of course, uh, LIGO and Virgo detected those. Uh, the amazing thing, the surprising fact, was that many of them involved massive black holes. Much more, you know, most of the black holes are around five to ten solar masses based on X-ray binaries that we find in the Milky Way. But the LIGO sources were mostly, you know, above several tenths of solar masses. And the question was, why? And a very simple explanation is that these black holes may be in star clusters and they sink to the center, just like dust particles settle in air, right? Because of gravity, the massive, objects segregate to the center and they find each other there. So the reason we see LIGO sources that are more massive than typical is because those very massive objects find each other, make binaries and appear as LIGO sources and produce very strong signals that we can see to a larger cosmological volume. That's why we have more of them. So obviously you have to take into account the larger volume. Uh, and it turns out in, in work that we did with Carl Rodriguez, we sort of forecasted what should be the evolution with redshift. You can see it uh, on the left panel here at the bottom. And it does match the current statistics of the 50 events uh, that, that LIGO Virgo produced. And one can also calculate the distribution of kick velocities. We did that with uh, Fragione. Um, distribution of kick velocities given the data we have on those binary mergers. And um, 
Those are kick velocities of hundreds of kilometers per second typically. And in order to get uh, second generation black holes, as we have some indications for, you really do not want uh, all of these remnant black holes that get like a recoil because of the ionosotropic emission of gravitational waves. You don't want them to leave the cluster. What that means is that the cluster that is most likely to hold the black holes after mergers, uh, these are the, the central, the nuclear star clusters in galaxies. Global clusters have a characteristic speed, uh, stellar speed of 10 kilometers per second and an escape speed a few times larger. They can, cannot hold the, these black holes after post-merger. So that's something to keep in mind. Perhaps the star clusters are at the centers of galaxies. We don't know. Uh, if you can do a global budget uh, of LIGO black holes, and this is work with Karan Jani um, that we have done. Uh, and let me just summarize. Well, so the idea is we know the star formation history of the universe. We know how many stars form per unit time. Uh, if you assume that some fraction, you know, taking some initial mass function for those stars, you can figure out the mass function of black holes that you would get. And that the fraction of the black holes that you get from the stars goes into the channel that produces these binaries. Okay, so you take all these factors of efficiency. You can ask which fraction of all black holes that we have from the global budget go into LIGO black holes, those that we detect as mergers. Now, one thing to keep in mind is in order for a binary black hole system to merge within the age of the universe, the separation needs to be less, less uh, than a tenth uh, of the Earth-Sun separation, uh, a tenth of an astronomical unit. Uh, that's not very far from the size of the progenitor star that makes them. So if you imagine two stars that make massive black holes, you know, even if they are almost touching each other in a binary, and then each of them makes a black hole, barely then you would get the two black holes to come together in a Hubble time. Again, an argument in favor of having a cluster environment where they might find each other more easily. Uh, but if you just make them in the field from two stars, you know, the stars need to be pretty close to each other in order for these to appear as LIGO sources. And then you can ask what fraction of all binaries do I need to go in this path? And it turns out at least, you know, for typical numbers, at least a percent. Um, so the, the range of numbers are definitely more than a tenth of a percent and there's somewhere uh, between a tenth of a percent and, and 10 percent is, is the range. And that's a substantial fraction of the overall budget. So we went over this, this analysis in, in the paper. Again, you can find it on the archive. Another paper we, we wrote with uh, Karan uh, Jani was uh, thinking about the future, you know, the next the next, uh, next after next generation of gravitational wave sources. So people are dreaming about the next observatory beyond LIGO and Virgo uh, on Earth. The only problem of us doing it on Earth is that Earth has seismic noise. So that uh, limits our ability to go to, to low frequencies. And more importantly, Earth has an atmosphere. So that limits the ability to create a, a very long vacuum. I mean, basically you need to, for the laser beams to remain unaffected uh, by, uh, through the path they go, you need to evacuate a tube, uh, bring it to very low vacuum. Uh, and you know, it's challenging when you construct very long tubes, uh, vacuum tubes. And uh, the moon, is a great environment for that purpose. So the moon was created by some impact on the earth a long time ago. We completely forgot about it, but now it's out there. It doesn't have an atmosphere, no seismic noise. Uh, I mean, there are very tight limits. We, we, we need to better measure it, uh, but suddenly well below the kind of noise that the LIGO Virgo experience, experience right now. Now, what would happen if we imagine a 40 kilometer 
LIGO on the moon. We called it Glock. Uh, uh, so it's uh, for exploration of cosmology. And the reason we, we called it uh, an observatory of cosmology uh, is because of what you see in the left panel. So this shows the observable volume of the universe. I didn't include here the multiverse, by the way. I, I don't know if it exists. I'm sure that some of you believe that it exists. But you know, some people also believe in other uh, stories. Uh, I believe in only things that we can test uh, observationally. And so I really believe in this volume of the observable vo uh, universe and it's limited in size because of the Big Bang. So there is a limited distance out to which we can see. And that's the edge of the dark region here. Uh, we hope to detect gravitational waves from that edge. Uh, that's what the B-mode polarization experiments are doing. We haven't yet done so. But we can, in the meantime, until we detect gravitational waves from uh, early cosmic times, we can fill up uh, the void <laughs> out to that uh, edge. Uh, and so what you can see here are different types of sources that this uh, lunar observatory, gravitational wave lunar observatory of cosmology, GLOC, would be able to, to see. Um, and um, you can see neutron star black holes, how far we can see uh, binary neutron stars, uh, binary black holes, uh, uh, intermediate mass black holes, um, and so forth. Um, and uh, what, what you see from this plot, the beautiful plot, uh, is that uh, in principle, we could uh, map a substantial fraction of the observable universe in gravitational waves if we build an observatory on the moon. So we hope that people listen. And of course, if you speak to an old person that used to be around, uh, you know, when uh, people discussed the moon uh, uh, decades ago, uh, that person will tell you that, uh, you know, probably this will not happen in your lifetime. Well, it's certainly true that it didn't happen in the last few decades, but now we are facing a new reality. Uh, there is the Artemis program that NASA is aiming to, to uh, follow, uh, irrespective of the administration in Washington, DC. The hope is NASA will continue on its path. It did that in previous administrations. And the, the goal is to bring uh, people, uh, actually the first woman as well to the moon uh, by 2024 and um, establish a sustainable base there. And of course, the question is, if we, if we put a settlement there, it's just like putting a settlement in the South Pole. After you do that for political reasons, you ask yourself, is there any science I can do? So in the South Pole, great, B-mode polarization. That came up as a brilliant idea. Why not do that? We are going to the South Pole for other reasons, let's establish, NSF decided to establish an observatory for B-mode polarization. Great. Uh, the same thing we can do in the moon. If we have some settlement there, why not use it for science? So this is a, a very uh, interesting uh, possibility for an observatory on the moon. So let me summarize my conclusions. Uh, so black holes, I, I focused mostly on the astrophysics, but I also mentioned the, a little bit about the fundamental physics aspects of black holes that are unresolved at the moment. Uh, we don't understand what the singularity is about. Um, and uh, I, th I see black holes as test beds for proposals to unify quantum mechanics and gravity. Um, and uh, unfortunately, people that work on string theory uh, shy away from the singularities of black holes. And I, had a, I don't really understand why there is not much more attention given to the singularities of black holes in, 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 in uh, communities that are aiming to resolve problems with classical general relativity, right? So the whole purpose of unifying it with quantum mechanics is to solve some problems we have, right? One of them is what's the nature of a singularity in a black hole? So why not address it? Why just worry about the anti decita space? Because we, you know, that's the, the lamp where we can find our keys there. I mean, there are some urgent questions that we need to resolve in physics. 
And unless you address those, you haven't really made progress. Um, and of course, there is the possible connection to the Big Bang singularity. Perhaps once we understand the singularities of black holes, we will understand the Big Bang, what happened around it better. And uh, maybe we, can, we could uh, even uh, imagine creating a baby universe in the laboratory once we understand how to do it by irritating the vacuum, which would be fantastic because uh, you know, I had my latest Scientific American article was posted on Saturday. Um, and uh, I thought nobody would read it because it has technical details about the vacuum. I just suggested that maybe the Big Bang had an umbilical cord that came from a laboratory by another civilization. So in principle, you can make baby universes if you understand how to do that. Uh, surprisingly, there were 100,000 uh, viewers of that uh, essay by today. I, I was really uh, struck uh, just a, a day and a half, uh, 100,000 people were curious about it. Anyway, um, there, there are fundamental questions also on the scale of the horizon, the event horizon, the information paradox is not resolved as of yet. What exactly went wrong in Hawking's calculation? Um, or maybe not wrong, maybe quantum mechanics is wrong. Um, there is, um, uh, for astrophysicists, of course, the, the uh, new ways to probe strong gravity near black hole horizons. And it's very exciting because it's an experimental frontier now uh, using both gravitational wave and electromagnetic data. And what I'm mostly curious about is not so much by the 50 events that LIGO Virgo detected that we can explain as black hole mergers. That's not exciting because it basically reaffirms what we already knew. What, is, what would be exciting is if we see new sources of gravitational waves that we never imagined. If LIGO sees suddenly a, a blip in the data that cannot be fit with a binary black hole system, that would be exciting. And that would be worth a Nobel Prize if it's a new type of source. So that's what I'm looking for. Um, to, I'm, I'm not an experimentalist, but I'm, I'm really hoping that they will find such a thing. Finally, I wanted just to mention very briefly that I have a book uh, coming out in about uh, a month. Uh, it's already on Amazon and, and uh, it, will be, uh, it will appear in uh, 20 countries worldwide. Uh, it's already translated to French, German, and so forth. And it's being translated to Chinese. And, uh, and um, if you are curious about why I say that, uh, what I say at the top here, which is, uh, then, then you might want to, to read it. Uh, what I said is, uh, when you are not ready to find exceptional things, you will never discover them. Uh, and with that, um, oh, by the way, on the left, I just wanted to mention uh, that I was asked by a photographer, a German photographer, to write the most important question that I have uh, that I think science can address. Uh, and she actually collected the photographs of about 60 uh, scientists. And they appeared just a couple of months ago in the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Science and Humanities. I, I couldn't go there. This is the photo on, on the wall. And, and the question that I thought is even more intriguing than the nature of singularities of black holes is, are we alone? Thank you very much. I'll be glad to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Avi, for the so inspirational talk. And uh, I think the talk has gone on for one hour. Do you still have time to stay for questions? Oh, that's, that's my fault. Therefore, I, I will take full responsibility and stay for 15 minutes more. Yes. OK. So yeah, as scheduled, we have 15 minutes for questions. I already see questions uh, in the chat. Uh, let me ask this question. I think uh, Robert has a question for Avi uh, 15 minutes ago. Uh, what is the view on Eddington versus super Eddington equation for super Okay, that's an excellent cycle? question. Um, so one, let me first explain why this question is interesting. Um, one of the puzzles we have is that we see black holes of more than a billion solar masses already in existence, less than a billion years after the Big Bang. Uh, it's sort of like finding a giant baby in a nursery. You ask, who are the parents? How did who fed this baby? You know, how did this baby come to be so giant? So uh, the real problem is, 
if you assume a radiative efficiency, uh, an efficiency for converting rest mass to radiation of 10%, and you also assume that the uh, luminosity is limited by the Eddington limit, which basically sets the scale for when the radiation force is as strong, uh, which is repulsive, is as strong as the attractive gravitational force. That's sort of the limiting luminosity beyond which you will push the matter out rather than let it accrete. So if you assume that at most you, you radiate at the Eddington limit, then uh, you get that you need to accrete all the time. Uh, if you start with a black hole seed, which is let's say 100 solar masses supplied by stars. So that's unusual you know, to, to keep shoving mass into the black hole at all time at the Eddington limit. Although it's possible, it seems unlikely. And also, you know, we're starting to get hints for that it's even not possible, given when stars started to form and the kind of seeds that you might get. So then the question is, could we, be, could we get accretion that is super Eddington, more than the Eddington limit? Now, the answer is, in nature, it exists. You all know about it. When you make a black hole out of a star, what happens is the core of the star loses its pressure support and collapses, makes a black hole. And then the envelope, the, the material around the core collapses as well. Now, the feeding of the black hole is highly super Eddington in that case. You get a solar mass per second falling into a stellar mass black hole. Solar mass per second. <laughs> you know, that's hugely super Eddington. How is that possible? How can a star collapse to a black hole if it's highly super Eddington based on what I said before? The answer is you have to compare the photon diffusion time outwards to the free fall, to the free fall time, the, the time it takes material to fall to the center. If photons take more time to diffuse out than the material takes to fall in, then they are carried with the material. The blanket of material is opaque and carries the radiation with it, shoves it into the black hole. So the Eddington limit is completely irrelevant. The Eddington limit is relevant only when photons are able to escape and act on the outermost layers. But if they are taken together with the material, they are part, you can think of them as part of the material that falls into the black hole. So super Eddington happens in nature. These are the collapses of stars to black holes. You, you know, we know that they exist. Okay, now the question is intermediate situations. You know, can it happen on the scale of um, a supermassive black hole? And if it can, then we resolve the, the timing issue. We can make big black holes early on in the universe. Uh, so the question is, what is the photon? So if you dump a lot of gas at the center of a galaxy to make a black hole, you can calculate the diffusion time of photons and compare that to the free fall time. And we actually wrote a paper about this with uh, Stuart Wyatt, where we show that in the early universe, you can get situations, circumstances that indeed feed so much gas to the center that the photon diffusion time is long. And so you end up with a situation similar to a star collapsing. Okay, so that's, that's possible. Uh, and uh, there, are, there are solutions for accretion flows that trap the radiation in principle. Uh, and uh, I would say that would be a compelling mechanism. Another approach to make these big black holes would be to make supermassive stars, stars that weigh let's say a million solar masses, then you get a jump start. You, you, you're starting from a seed that is very massive. Okay. Uh, I think uh, on the chat, I will skip the chat because uh, I think Karan uh, Jani is answering a question uh, on the chat already. So uh, there are uh, three more questions here. Uh, Wen Tao Luo, uh, you can speak now. Oh yeah, thanks. Um, this is uh, Wen Tao from Japan. Uh, I'm Chinese. Oh, uh, we're... Thank you. We really appreciate yeah. the fact that you're up so late. It's midnight. It's now, already midnight. Is... Yeah. 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 It's midnight. Uh, it's uh, thanks for the inspiring talk. And I'm a more observer. And and your talk is the most 
observer friendly from distinguished the theor Half theorists. Of my best friends are observers, you know. <laughs> yeah, so I have uh, some uh, several uh, three observational uh, questions uh, um, relative to your talks. So you mentioned like the uh, two stars uh, collide with each other uh, near the uh, black holes uh, and with uh, very high speed and also the emit amount of uh, like 10 to the 54 ergs like a uh, and it can be observed. So can you predict the light curve? Yes. Uh, like a super, okay. So that's part of the paper and uh, we'll be glad to send you a copy when we are done. Yes. Oh, that's so, great. And so we, are, yeah. we are calculating the light curves, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, if uh, the light curve is uh, similar to the variation of the quasars and also especially strong lens of the quasars and this actually intrinsic uh, variation can be used as a time delay constraining uh, oh, from strong lens systems. Interesting. So that's... We'll, say, we'll send you a copy and appreciate your comments. Um, oh, great, before, thanks. Before we submit even. Oh, really? Uh, so uh, later I will just write my... Uh, yeah, just send me an email and I'll, I'll get back to you. Okay, thanks. And also my second question is th that because I'm working uh, for the uh, HSC Subaru telescope, Mm -hmm. So recently, we published a paper of the three uh, quasars with the two black holes. Mm -hmm. So the closest one is at redshift of 0.4-ish, and uh, the distance uh, uh, corresponding to a co-moving distance of 3.9 kiloparsec, mm -hmm. two supermassive black holes. So uh, I would also like to send you this paper if you... Uh, okay, like that would be very... Yes, of course, there are dual... I mean... Obviously, there is a catalog of dual black holes where you see two yes. black holes at different phases. And of course, yeah. the closer they are to each other, the more rare they, they would be because the, the shrinkage time would be shorter. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we sort of have a limit on how long uh, such systems spend uh, close, you know, very close to each other because uh, of the uh, pulsar timing array limit on the gravitational wave background. Um, but um, yeah, it's a very exciting frontier uh, um, trying to image galaxies looking for dual, dual black holes. Um, my student, uh, Laura Blecker, did her PhD on, on this subject. I see. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Uh, that's a very inspiring talk. Uh, I Thank think you. I'll leave the chances to other two questions. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so next, Yuan, you may speak. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, my question is, when you are talking about the speed limit of the SGRA star, uh, uh, less than 10%, uh, do you think uh, this is uh, natural from astrophysical interpretations, or is the indication why it's so low? Would that be indication of uh, something like super radiance or other uh, speed loss mechanism? Uh, that's okay. So, um... By the way, I should say the spins of black holes uh, are expected to evolve over time because there are two mechanisms that would control them. If you have accretion of gas from a stable disk, a disk that fits the black hole steadily over a long period of time, if it fits it more than a few percent of its mass, you will get a rapidly spinning black hole because the material comes from the innermost stable circular orbit and carries the angular momentum, feeds it to the black hole. So you can do the calculation how much angular momentum is donated to the black hole from material falling in from the ISCO, the innermost stable circular orbit. And by that, you can calculate the growth of the spin. Okay, and, and it's very quick. You don't need a lot. You don't need all the mass of the black hole to come from the disk. And uh, that's one mechanism to get high spin. Uh, however, if you have mergers of black holes and the, and the mergers are occurring at the random orientation, uh, then you will average out the spin orientation and uh, you will get the spin down. So it, depending on how many mergers you have, if you imagine, let's say N, where N is much larger than one, N mergers, uh, then uh, and each of them has a black hole with a random orientation of the spin vector, uh, you know, you can, there will be a one over square root of n reduction in the amplitude. And then, um, so, so that these are competing processes that we know take place, accretion and mergers. And the question is, which one wins? And 
you know, the Milky Way, I would imagine, well, first of all, by now we have some evidence that it had a major merger with a one to three ratio. And that's based on uh, the latest Gaia data and uh, that uh, indicate that the Milky Way about 10 billion years ago had a merger, one to three rat. And uh, you know, that could have reduced the black hole spin. Uh, uh, or you could imagine uh, global clusters sinking to the center and bringing intermediate mass black holes that keep averaging the spin. Uh, or you can imagine multiple gas disks. So we know of two planes, two preferred planes, as I mentioned, that made the S stars. And that's just over the past 10 million years because these stars are really young. We know that over 10 million years, you had two disk, uh, two gas disks that are not aligned with each other. We have evidence for that. So now multiply that by a factor of a thousand because the age of the universe is a thousand times 10 million years. So you, if you had two over the past 10 million, I would argue at least 10,000 such disks formed if we are not at a special time now, okay? 10,000 disks with random orientations will give you a spin less than 0.1. I would say this is the most likely reason. If the black hole grew through a thousand disks, <laughs> then, you know, square root of a thousand is uh, 3%, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I see, thank you. Oh, wait. Please. Hi, Avi. I wanted to congratulate you on a fantastic talk, both deep and broad simultaneously, which is a real achievement. Thank you. I, have... I, I should thank the pandemic because, uh, you know, it's, it's really been a, a time of, uh, for me, a time where I could focus on science uh, without worrying about what my colleagues keep saying, you know, and and uh, that was a very productive time for me personally. Without anyway. even spending time commuting between Lexington and Cambridge. <laughs> That's another thing. <laughs> My question is a very specific one. I was wondering what sets the limit of 42% on the conversion of mass falling through black hole into clean energy. Oh, will. that's very simple. Uh, this boils down to a calculation done in uh, 1972, uh, or even, no, even before, Bardeen did it uh, before. Um, uh, so uh, it has to do with the innermost stable circular orbit around a rapidly spinning black hole, okay? The ISCO. And you can calculate the binding energy, the gravitational binding energy of a parcel of matter that gets there, okay? And that energy can be deposited because uh, through uh, viscous dissipation. Once you get inside the ISCO, then this parcel of matter falls radially inwards and you just don't have time. Oops. Oops, sorry, uh, okay. cursor fell. Um, you just don't have time to radiate um, because the parcel of gas, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, the parcel of gas falls radially towards the horizon inside the ISCO. So the last uh, uh, bit of uh, space where energy can be dissipated is at the ISCO and the binding energy there tells you the radiative efficiency and that's 42% for a maximally spinning black hole. For a thin disk, this calculation is done for a thin disk where the, the pressure makes no difference uh, regarding the orbits. Uh, the, the disk is cold and you know particles are moving in a single plane. Um, so that's where the 42% comes from. And in principle, uh, one can imagine ways of extracting energy from the spin of the black hole where you get more than 100%. So the blanford znayek uh, effect is uh, tapping the spin energy of the black hole through uh, magnetic fields. And uh, through the blanford znayek effect, you can get more than 100% of the rest mass of the material because you are using up the flywheel, the, the spin of the black hole in addition 
to the rotation of the matter. What I described before is just the binding energy of the matter around the black hole. But if there is an additional source of energy, which is the, the spin of the black hole that basically um, frame drags the entire space time around, that gives you access to a res reservoir of energy beyond the rest mass. And that can give you more than 100% efficiency. Thank you. Excuse me. Yes? Yeah. Uh, is this 42% the total amount of energy you can extract from a, a two-body system? No, no, it's not too bad. So you have a black hole, okay? And the black hole is very massive. Now let's imagine a test particle orbiting it, okay? What you can show in Newtonian physics, you can have, just like the planets move around the sun, you can have a circular orbit for every planet, irrespective of the planet's distance from the sun. But when you have a black hole, the Schwarzschild solution has some effective potential, which is different than Keplerian at, at small distances from the center. It has a special shape. And that potential, if you look at orbit, circular orbit in that potential, you find that below a certain radius, the orbits are unstable. And an orbit that you perturb a little bit in the radial direction will fall straight into the black hole, okay? So this is called the innermost stable circular orbit. And, it, and, and, and the location of the orbit depends on the spin. And the binding energy that you have at that orbit gives you the maximum amount of uh, energy that you can extract from a piece of matter um, that is rubbing uh, by viscosity against other pieces of matter, okay? Now, if on top of that, you have the spin of the space-time, that's a separate matter, if you're using that. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, this number, 42%, is very close to square root of 2 minus 1, isn't it? I think it is, uh, yeah, it, it may be related to that. Uh, I, I, I forgot it's the exact actually, formula, but if you go to the derivation, it's actually in Shapiro and Tokolsky book, if you know this book uh, on uh, black holes, white dwarf neutrons. Like in the Carnot, uh, uh, Sadi Carnot uh, cycle, well, actually going into the details of the dynamical way you do it, actually it follows from the Christodoulou formula for the so-called irreducible mass squared, which is the area of a stationary black hole. So this follows from the area law. Uh, no, it, uh, it's not related to the area of the, because the radiation is not coming from the horizon. The radiation is coming from the matter that is circling around the black hole. It has nothing to do with, it's just the matter that is moving around and, and dissipating its energy. You know, and, and that happens much farther out, the ISCO, the innermost stable circular orbit is 6 gm over c squared. It's three but times the short We are radius. talking about the mechanism, but why is such a thing like a conservation of energy? You don't need to know if something collides, how it does it, or is dissipated. You just do the balance before and after. So it actually follows from Hawking's area theorem for, uh, for, the, you know, for a black hole. You think about a black, black hole have a spin, a black hole. The assumption is that this is a Kerr black hole. If it is not a Kerr black hole, you cannot claim it. But no, no, no. It I'm, I'm hole, talking also about, sorry, I'm, the, the 42 is for Kerr, but for a Schwarzschild black hole, it's 5.7%. There is a similar number that applies to zero spin, and that is 5.7%. And that corresponds to the binding energy at the innermost stable circular orbit of a Schwarzschild black hole. So the same thing can be done irrespective of the spin, what I was describing. What you are describing is something different. Oh, oh but, but of course it is the same thing okay. because okay. when you have a body moving around a, a, a spin zero black hole, the, the bound system has angular momentum. So if this thing is eaten up, you end up with a, with a Kerr black hole, it's no longer going to be a Schwarzschild. So you apply again, you apply again the area law and you get the efficiency. And you don't have to look at the particular mechanism. This is the, you see, this is the upper bound, the same way you have a Carnot cycle in thermodynamics. Which okay, maybe there, is some deep, maybe there is some deeper connection that I, I do not appreciate right now, but yeah, maybe. I, I, I was okay. thinking about I, I can, it. From... I, can send you the, I can send you the, 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 the reference, or actually the argument. Okay. It's a simple calculation. I have done okay. it many times with my students. You know. I learn something new every day. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate okay. to look at that.
Thank you. Thank you for the discussion. Avi, can I ask one more question? Uh, yeah. Uh, so my question, I have two questions related. Um, I, I ask them together. So when you calculate the population of uh, solar mass star, uh, solar mass black holes observed in LIGO, what is the initial condition that, that you use? And also, um, uh, what do you think uh, is there? Uh, what, what what is your uh, current view of the origin of uh, those black holes as a primordial or as an astrophysical origin? Right. So, is there, is there any consensus or what is your view on that? Yeah. So, I think based on the fact that we detect mostly massive black holes, more than their sh uh, share in the population of black holes, you know, most black holes are five to 10 solar masses. We detect much more massive ones, uh, which we can see to larger distances, of course. Uh, and I think there is a, this is a very strong hint that we are seeing environments of star clusters where the black holes segregate to the center and find each other. And then it's not just like making binaries in the field where you start with some separation and, and let them, uh, you know, uh, two stars are at some separation and then the stars go and make black holes. The black holes already exist and they find each other. And then question of what separation they start from depends on the dynamics, the density of stars in the center of the cluster, okay? Uh, the density of, um, of, of black hole remnants of different masses. Uh, and um, uh, what, what is clear is that uh, you need to start, if you want the gravitational wave time scale to be less than the Hubble time, you need them to start at a separation that is smaller or comparable, comparable to the size of their progenitor stars. You know, to me, that is an illustration that it's most likely you make the black holes and then they find each other rather than you have a binary star system to start with. Because putting them at such close proximity, the two stars, uh, would lead to a lot of effects of mass transfer and you know, complications in the, in the picture. Uh, and also the rates are not necessarily uh, explained. With respect to primordial, I don't think there is a good reason to expect that. Um, we know that um, black holes uh, cannot make the dark matter if they have a few, you know, somewhere between five and a hundred solar masses. There are very tight limits from the microlensing, um, of, you know, data that we collected over the past decades. Uh, so black holes of this mass are constrained to be much less than the dark matter. And then the question is, uh, you know, how would you make them in cosmology? You need the horizon of the universe to include more mass than these black holes have at the time when you make them. So you make primordial black holes through density fluctuations of all the unity on the scale of the horizon of the universe. Yes, that's and right. how do you generate? So the physics, when the universe contains a solar mass, the physics is standard model physics. It's not high energy, it's not very high energy where we haven't yet explored the, in accelerators. It's a physics that we have explored in accelerators and we understand quite well. And the universe is at temperatures that are rather low when it makes such black holes. And, you know, I, I find it hard to see a scenario that would uh, be sufficiently uh, constrained by all that we know from the standard model and, and still produce density fluctuations of all the unity. Uh, uh, I, I think the current situation uh, for cosmologists is if the if the, really uh, there is a problem in astrophysics, uh, I don't think making I don't of think the black holes, the cosmology uh, can make up model for it. It's fine tuned. Uh, right, it's, right, right. It's it's not a problem to make a model for it. For example, inflation to inject some spikes in density perturbations. I some, will uh, tell you when I, I will think uh, of primordial black holes is very likely if we find evidence for gravitational waves from objects that are less than a solar mass. Less than solar mass. Uh -huh. Yeah, even less than two. So if we find evidence that they are black holes when they are less than two solar masses. Right now, LIGO, whenever they see something less than two, between one and two, they say it's a neutron star. But they don't know unless they, there was one event where electromagnetic radiation was seen. So in principle, if they detect a black hole below two solar masses, that would make a strong case for a, a primordial origin because stars do not make such black holes. Stars so so, far, do, uh -huh. yeah. so uh -huh. far, the population uh, that have been observed, you think there's no tension oh, yeah. of astrophysics? Look, why, why would the objects that we see show a cutoff at the high mass end 
you know, even though people talk about more than 50 solar mass black holes, there is one detected, you know, uh, in the per, per instability gap. Even though there are some anomalies there, there is a clear evidence for a cutoff in the mass function of black holes above 40 or 50 solar masses, which you expect from stellar, stellar evolution. You know, that's called the per instability gap that uh, stars more massive than stars between 160 and 250 solar masses end up exploding as a per instability supernova. Based on fundamental physics, this is the only type of supernova that we fully understand. So there is not much uncertainty there. And you do see it. You do see a decline in the abundance of very massive black holes that we would have seen easily because the more massive black holes would be seen to greater distances. So on the one hand, you see that. On the other hand, you see a cutoff at low masses. You know, we don't, we don't see uh, one solar mass uh, objects merging a lot or less than that. And so to me, you know, and we would expect exactly this cutoff at the low mass end also from stars. To me, that's very strong uh, evidence that these are, you know, made in stars because they behave just like, you know, if it, if it uh, uh, talks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's a duck. I mean, obviously, you know, you can imagine uh, an elephant that somehow tries to be as small as a duck or something, but, I mean, but it, it's not reasonable. I would say that all the evidence points in the direction of them being astrophysical, given the mass boundaries that we associate with stellar mass black holes. As a result, I think, you know, it, they are not promoted. I see what you mean. Okay, thank you so much, Abby, for your time, for the really fantastic talk. And this concludes our, our series in this year. And uh, we hope to see everybody in, in, in next year, to, uh, 2021. Uh, I hopefully will be a better year than 2020. Thanks for inviting me yeah. and best thank wishes you. for the holidays for everyone. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, thanks, Abby. Great talk. <laughs>